Dr. Peter Hamilton is a hypertension specialist at the University of Alberta. He is the head of a large hypertension clinic and has been involved with numerous scientific research projects on this topic. Today our topic will be uh, hypertension, uh, which as you know is a very common medical condition which really probably the majority of people in our population uh, will experience at some point in their lifetime. And I guess I'd like to start out this interview just by asking you, um, can hypertension be considered a disease unto itself or is it more of a sign of a more serious underlying condition? Yeah, hypertension really is a, a risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease. It's a physical sign in that you measure the blood pressure indirectly and the higher that blood pressure, the more likely you are to develop a vascular or cardiovascular event mm -hmm. such as a heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, heart failure or peripheral vascular disease. Okay, um, so at what uh, point would a patient's blood pressure be considered to be abnormal or sort of be a risk factor? Well, at almost any higher blood pressure, your risk will go up. So it's, it's, it's actually a continuum. Mm -hmm. And I would consider that uh, a hypertension is that blood pressure where intervention mm -hmm. does more good than harm. Mm -hmm. So the cutoff point for what treatment you would institute therapy for would be dependent upon what other coexistent risk factors the patient has okay. and the overall cardiovascular risk. If you've got a person with a low cardiovascular risk and primary prevention, your cutoff would be 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Okay. If the person has other underlying cardiovascular risk factors such as pre-existing disease, for example a previous stroke, previous myocardial infarction, uh, chronic kidney failure, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes mellitus, then you would institute therapy at a lower threshold. At the present time, that threshold is 135 over 85 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Uh, and just for clarification for uh, those watching who don't quite know, um, the two values that you get uh, in a person's blood pressure, the, the higher number and the lower number, what exactly do those two values represent? The, the top number is the systolic blood pressure, which correlates with the peak blood pressure uh, when the heart contracts. The bottom one is the diastolic blood pressure, which is the baseline blood pressure when the heart relaxes. So you get two readings when you record the blood pressure. The systolic, which would be the top one, written on top of the bottom one, which would be the diastolic. Okay. Um, now, uh, I've heard uh, certain physicians uh, sometimes categorize uh, sort of blood pressure into two different categories, uh, one being essential or primary hypertension uh, versus the other being uh, secondary hypertension. Um, could you just touch a little bit on what the differences are between? Well, before I go into that, I think I should actually clarify you can get differences in terms of systolic and diastolic hypertension. Younger people, generally speaking, tend to get the development of diastolic hypertension, i.e. the bottom number is high, but the top number, the systolic, is low or normal. As we age, the systolic blood pressure goes up, and typically older persons tend to get what's called isolated systolic hypertension, where the systolic blood pressure is elevated, and the lower, the underneath number, the diastolic blood pressure, is actually normal or low. Uh, essential hypertension is a, a rather poor term uh, for explaining that the physician actually doesn't know the mechanism for the underlying hypertension. The likely mechanism in essential hypertension, however, lies at the endothelial wall of the small arterioles, which is exceedingly difficult to study and evaluate in a clinical context, but that's likely the mechanism. It's probably generated by peripheral vasoconstriction, which then causes a rise in the blood pressure. Okay. A secondary hypertension is when we can identify an obvious causative factor such as chronic kidney disease or an uh, endocrine tumor that's actually causing an elevation in the blood pressure. That would be termed secondary hypertension. Okay. Um, so I guess that sort of uh, leads in on to my next question here, um, which would uh, generally be, I guess, uh, what are the main causes of hypertension? And I guess specifically maybe starting out by what sorts of lifestyle factors contribute to the development of hypertension? Well, the development of hypertension is a mixture between nature and nurture. So your genetic predisposition would play a very important role in the development of hypertension. So if you've got first degree relatives that have developed high blood pressure at a younger age, they're much more likely to have children that will have an elevated blood pressure. Combined with that are environmental factors, particularly high salt intake, lack of exercise, an increase in body weight would be key factors developing or contributing towards the development of an elevation in blood pressure at a younger age. Okay, 
And um, so I don't know if this is uh, sort of the same question of uh, the genetic predisposition or not, but um, in terms of the uh, sex or gender of a patient and the ethnicity of a patient, are there certain people who tend to be more predisposed uh, to hypertension? Generally speaking, there's not that much difference in gender, but there is a significant difference in terms of race. The North American uh, black population, for example, are very susceptible to high blood pressure, and even for a given blood pressure seem to have a higher risk than an aged matched Caucasian cohort of patients. Okay. So a, uh, age is a critical factor and uh, ethnicity are critical factors in the development of hypertension and its associated risk. Okay, okay. Now, so my understanding um, of high blood pressure is, is that uh, if you took uh, just a certain person, say a 40, 50 year old uh, guy who has hypertension but because of the fact he hasn't been to a physician lately uh, doesn't actually realize that his blood pressure is elevated, um, uh, technically uh, that patient wouldn't be aware of the fact that they have blood pressure because there is uh, so few external symptoms and so I guess my question is is why should a patient who has high blood pressure but no other uh, medical complications um, what is the concern um, or why why do we care about elevated blood pressure in the long term? Well the higher the blood pressure the higher your risk so and, and blood pressure correlates very closely with the development of what's called hemorrhagic stroke and uh, certainly at very high readings for example, President Roosevelt, before he died, had a blood pressure of about 290 on 180. That would be considered catastrophic hypertension, accelerated or malignant hypertension. And even modest reduction in blood pressure in those individuals conveys a substantial uh, risk reduction, including reduction in mortality. For patients with only modestly elevated blood pressure, what's really important is to look at the overall cardiovascular risk. So if you've got someone who's young, healthy, lean, uh, doesn't smoke, is non-diabetic, their absolute risk for an event in 10 years is modestly elevated. On the other hand, somebody who smokes, has diabetes, renal disease, as well as hypertension would have a substantially increased risk of a vascular event and clearly would benefit greatly from pharmacological intervention. Okay. What sort of uh, treatment options actually do exist uh, for someone who is diagnosed with high blood pressure? Well, for everybody with hypertension, you should always look at the non-pharmacological management to begin with. And this is always used in conjunction with pharmacological therapy, ideally. Although adherence with non-pharmacological therapy is not always that good. The most important principles of non-pharmacological therapy would, first of all, be salt restriction. We tend to eat way too much salt. Most of us should be eating less than 3 grams and as low as uh, 2.3 grams of salt a day. And certainly hypertensive patients should be eating even less than that, particularly if they've got chronic renal disease, if they're African American, if they're obese, or if they're elderly. Secondly is weight reduction. We tend to look at what's called the body mass index where we correct the patient's weight for their height and we come up with a number of 25. So your body mass index should be less than 25. But in addition to that, it's where the fat actually is. It appears that a fat distributed around the abdomen called centripetal obesity or android obesity is more strongly associated with cardiovascular risk than gynecoid obesity or the fat that tends to be distributed over the hips. And in this regard, we actually measure the waist circumference, which in a man should be less than 102 centimeters, and a woman less than 88 centimeters. The next important factor would be to exercise on a regular basis. Not only does it tend to lower blood pressure, but it helps you control body weight. And perhaps most important of all is smoking cessation. Smoking is the single most important modifiable risk factor, and when it's present in the context of hypertension, conveys a significant cardiovascular risk. Okay, now um, uh, apart from the lifestyle factors, um, uh, if a patient does um, or does have to go on to pharmacological therapies in conjunction with lifestyle modification, um, how effective are the medications we have at controlling blood pressure? Well, all the antihypertensive drugs actually are marketed, and in order to be marketed, have to demonstrate unequivocally that they lower blood pressure. So all the drugs on the market right now, and there are six major classes, are very effective at lowering blood pressure. Some of them will lower blood pressure more effectively in certain subgroup populations, and on average they are lower blood pressure by approximately 10%. So even, it depends very much on what the baseline blood pressure is. If the baseline blood pressure is very high, obviously you get a very significant initial drop in the blood pressure, but you may not be able to achieve a target blood pressure with a single agent. 
And in fact, for many patients with high blood pressure, you'll require two, three, and occasionally even four medications to reach the target blood pressure. Okay. And um, for, these for these medications, uh, are there any significant side effects that patients tend to experience when they're on them? Well, they're generally fairly well tolerated. Um, some of them have been around for many years, like thiazide diuretics, and others are fairly recently on the market, such as angiotensin receptor blockers. But overall, they're well tolerated. Each class of antihypertensive, however, has a different set of side effects. Okay. Um, and so one final question for you. Uh, let me pose, a, I guess, a hypothetical uh, patient, maybe a 40-year-old guy who a uh, newly diagnosed uh, with elevated blood pressure and uh, none of the other risk factors you talked about. Um, what is the prognosis or long-term chance that this patient will be able to be managed effectively um, with the available medications uh, in our knowledge currently of blood pressure? Well, the, the management is very effective. Anti pharmacological therapy for hypertension is very effective, particularly in reduce, reducing the incidence of hemorrhagic stroke. You can see statistics have demonstrated over the last 50 years a dramatic decline in hemorrhagic stroke in North America, which has been largely attributed to improvement in blood pressure control. The patients, however, that benefit the greatest from blood pressure reduction tend to be the elderly because as you go, get older, the absolute risk in that population tends to go up. So even a modest reduction in blood pressure, for example, a 10 millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure might reduce the likelihood of a hemorrhagic stroke by as much as 40%. It, it may not mean that, you, it, it, it tends to mean that you'll live longer and hopefully healthier. Instead of having a stroke at the age of 50, you live on to the age of 80 or hopefully even 90 without a significant event like a stroke. Okay. Well, very interesting. Um, Dr. Hamilton, I'd like to thank you very much for all of the uh, interesting insights that you've given us uh, into hypertension. It's, uh, I'm sure, a very important issue to uh, many of our viewers out there. Um, and so I really appreciate all the information you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.